So the title for my message today is Jesus, What Are the Odds? What are the odds that Jesus would do what all of the prophets and all of the Old Testament said that he was going to do? And what are the odds that he would be able to pull it off? So if you would, if you're, uh, you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 24. That was the first part of the passage that Mr. Beeler here just read, Luke 24. Now we're going to read the kind of the second half of that, most of the second half at least. And as you're turning there, this story, it kind of is broken into three parts. We're really going to get into two of them today. But this story, it starts out with a sad journey. And then we have scripture learning And then we have spirits turning. I made it kind of rhymey so you could uh, remember it or write it down. So, Jesus, what are the odds? Luke chapter 24, verse 13, we're going to start right there. So it says, now that same day, so remember, he just read that. The ladies, they went to the tomb. It was empty. They went back and they told the apostles. And all of that just happened right after that. Now that same day, two of them we're going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, who is them? It says two of them. And I always tell you guys, context is key. When you are reading scripture, don't just go to your verse and read it and, and think that you're going to get everything from it. Sometimes you have to read some before. Sometimes you have to read some after. So who is them? Well, if you look back at verse 9, it says, when they... And here's another context. This is talking about the women. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. So the others are not just the 11 disciples. Remember, there was 12 disciples. Now there are 11 disciples. Judas is no more. And it says, to the 11 and to all the others. Who are the others? Well, they were other disciples, not like the big 12 that we know of, but they were apostles or, or disciples that were followers of Jesus, okay? So he, he had more than the 11 or the 12 a lot of the times following him around, so there was more gathered there. So two of those guys were there with them. So verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now, now everything that had happened, it was Sunday morning. Or now it was in the afternoon. There was no Jesus. It had been three days. What do you think their demeanor would have been? If they were talking about everything that happened over the past week, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, Hosanna, and then the trial and the crucifixion, and three days later, what would be their demeanor? It would be sad, right? Uh, Discouraged, somber, disappointed, crushed. Remember, not only... Did their friend and their mentor die, but their hope for the Messiah, their hope that Jesus was actually the Messiah came to save them, their hope was crushed and gone. So that's what, I mean, they were talking about these things and they would have been just crushed. Verse 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, this is very fascinating to me. Uh, you know, my mind kind of goes like, I want to see this happen. There's these two guys, they're walking this seven mile journey to this village Emmaus. We don't even know where this village is now, but we know it's about seven miles from Jerusalem. And like, I don't know if Jesus was like hiding behind a tree or a bush, and when they walked by, he kind of stepped out and did that thing. I don't know if poof, he just appeared right behind him, and they're like, whoa, what in the world? Where did this guy come from? But it would have been normal for another traveler to kind of join up with them and talk with them. So, but it says they were kept from recognizing them. Now, why didn't they recognize Jesus? Well, we've got a couple reasons why they may not have recognized him. Number one, they weren't looking for him. They, they, they were walking along. They thought he was dead. That's it. It's over. Game over. Lights out. He's gone. They weren't looking for Jesus, and I think a lot of the times we make the same mistake too. In that very well-known passage in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I think so often we don't do that. We don't seek after Jesus like we need to. And a lot of the times we're like, 
God, where are you? I don't see you. God, come, come, I've got problems, God. Come and fix my problems. Swoop down, fix my problems, and then you can run along now. Isn't that how we treat Jesus? And then we go right back to our lives of our problems and our issues and all that. And we kind of just push Jesus off to the side and we're not constantly looking for him. So number one, the reason why they didn't see him is they weren't looking for him. But I think it's really more like number two. Jesus disguised himself to have real, honest conversation with them. I think that's why Jesus did this. Um, There's a Shakespeare play. It's Henry V. And King Henry dresses up as one of the soldiers, and he goes out uh, to the battlefield, to the camp, and he talks amongst the the soldiers to kind of find out what they think about him and how they think the battle is going. I also heard a story of a, a Russian ruler or a czar that he would dress up like a peasant. And he would just kind of go amongst the townspeople, and he would talk politics with the townspeople just to get their opinion on how he was doing things that he can change. It's a great thing to do. But there was a big difference between King Henry and this Russian ruler and Jesus. See, King Henry and the Russian ruler, they were doing it for their benefit because they wanted knowledge, and Jesus was doing it for their benefit because he wanted to have some real, honest conversation with them. Verse 17 He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, did Jesus ask this because he didn't know? Of course not. Of course Jesus knew, but he's kind of playing into this narrative. Hey, what what do you guys, as you guys are walking here, what are you guys talking about? And it says, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? A little bit cynical of an answer, isn't it? Like, where in the world have you been? And remember, this was Passover. There was hundreds of thousands of Jews that had migrated into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Jesus comes in, they're all screaming, Hosanna, save us. The problem is... And, and I, I got to tell this story. I got to do a little bit of preaching this week. It was pretty cool. Um, most of you guys know I like to go to CrossFit. And our wad, our workout of the day that we did on Friday, it's called the Passion Wad. Uh, uh, the guys that own the gym that I go to are Christians, so we have the Passion Wad. So it starts out with a bunch of jump rope, and then we load a 70-pound bag up on our shoulders, and we do an 800-meter walk. And then if that's not enough, we finish it off with about 100 burpees or so. But... We're out there on our walk, and there's a group of us, and I'm going, okay, God, I I know, I know, I know. I'm supposed to do a little preaching here. So I start talking to the people that I was with and telling about a time that I was in um, Israel and walking La Via Dolorosa and all that stuff, and so kind of to liken this walk to that and Jesus carrying his cross. And one of them asked me, hey, do you uh, do Palm Sunday? Like, do you do the reenactment and all that? And I said, no, we don't do it like that, but we celebrate Palm Sunday. And I, I, I started to ask them, hey, do you know, you know what Palm Sunday really stood for and what they were saying when he came into town? And, and they said, no. And I said, well, it, you know, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us. And they're like, oh, okay. I said, but here's the problem. They were yelling, save us because of their problems. They were yelling, save us from this Russian rule. Save us from this, basically, captivity in our own town. Save us from that. And that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to save them and to save us from our sin. And when Jesus didn't save them from the Roman rule, that Hosanna quickly changed to what? Crucify him. And so Jesus, he's just kind of walking along with them, trying to have some real conversation and he says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Like, like, how do you not know what's going on? Like, this whole week was wrapped around this guy, Jesus, and, like, he died, and that was it. Like, like what, have you been sleeping or something? What in the world is going on? And watch what Jesus does. Verse 19, he says, what things, he asked. <laughs> Typical Jesus, right? Again, he's not lying, but he's kind of playing along to this narrative. 
I, why don't you tell me what's been going on is what Jesus is doing here. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now, what verb tense is was? It's past tense, isn't it? See, they, their, their hope was done. They were like, he was a prophet, mighty, mighty, and you know, indeed, before God and all the people. Like, he was sent from God is what they were saying, but he was. Past tense. He's gone. Verse 20. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Again, what, what verb tense is hoped? It's past tense again, right? And they're crushed. And they even say, and, and, and even more, it's the third day. Like, I know we talked about, like, rising again three days later. But, and remember, their day ended and began at sunset. So the day was almost over. So they're saying, like, like if that whole third day thing was true, it didn't happen. That's what we are talking about. Verse 22, they keep going. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now, apparently, they didn't fully believe the women. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Now, interesting thing here, did they just expect Jesus to hang around the tomb all day? I mean, it's like they, you know, just people could come by and check him out. You know, he's just, I'm just going to be over here if you guys want to come and see me. And maybe that's what they expected Jesus to do. But here we go. Typical Jesus. Verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ouch. I mean, how would you like to be the guy that's known in the Bible for Jesus calling foolish? And, and even that, Jesus says, how foolish and, and slow you are to believe all that the prophets said. Like Jesus is going, guys, you have the whole scriptures, all of it, and it all talks about Jesus. And he's going, you guys didn't even believe that. How foolish are you? He goes on, 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? He's saying, didn't you know that all of this stuff had to happen? It was written right there in your scriptures. You should have known. Now, before we get to the next verse, which is the key verse that's going to spring us into what I really want to talk about today, I want to point out the validity of Jesus. Because a lot of people try to downplay Jesus or, well, there wasn't really a Jesus or there, there was a Jesus, but he wasn't really who he said and all that stuff. So I want to give you three credentials of Jesus Christ, and then we're really going to look at the last one. Number one, his impact on history. Now, no one no one has made nearly the impact on history as Jesus Christ has. You, you cannot pick out one single person. He was known thousands of years before he came. He was very well known when he came. And 2,000 years later, we still celebrate him. And we still worship him. And there's millions and millions and millions and even billions of people on this planet that worship this guy. That's pretty legit. That's a pretty good reason to believe that there is some validity to Jesus, too. Number one, his impact on history. Number two, his physical bodily resurrection from the dead. And I say this all the time. Any guy that can predict his death, burial, and resurrection and then pull it off, I'm with that guy. Like, like that guy obviously knows something that I don't, and I'm going to follow that guy. And Jesus was that guy. And, and again, a lot of people try to dispute this. Oh, that didn't really happen. Again, there was no Jesus. The, the, he didn't really get crucified. There was no resurrection. Guys, just do a Google search. Okay, don't believe everything that Uncle Google tells you, okay? But do a Google search. There are tons of non 
biblical, historical, secular writings about Jesus, about his followers, about the miracles that he did, about his death, burial, and even references his resurrection. Non-biblical, secular, historical writings proving Jesus is who he said he was. So number one, his impact on history. Number two, his physical bodily resurrection from the dead. And number three, the one that we're going to talk about today, fulfilled prophecy. And I've been saying it over and over and over. There is so much in the scriptures that, again, are proven undisputable that they were written thousands of years before Jesus came. Fulfilled prophecy. Now, most religions, they're based on the teachings of their leaders, right? And they and say, you know, oh, you should do this, or you should be, you know, good to people, or this, and it's based on the teachings, but not Christianity. Christianity, in fact, we, we get that word, Christ, Christ. It's based on a person, and it's based on an event. And it's based on an event that happened in history that we can prove, and all of the events leading up to it. So three credentials of Jesus Christ. Number one is impact on history, Number two is physical bodily resurrection from the dead. And number three, fulfilled prophecy. And I want to talk about that prophecy real quick today. So verse 27, this is as far as we're going to go in this passage. Jesus says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, unfortunately, this passage does not give us all of the prophecies that are in the Old Testament. I, I really do wish it did, but we can kind of guess where Jesus went because he talked about these things in other places and it was talked about so much and it very accurately describes all of the events that have taken place within the last week and through the whole life of Jesus. So, and it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, it doesn't mean the life of Moses, it means the first five books of the Bible, which were written by Moses, which is the Pentateuch or the Torah, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So he started there, went all through the prophets, and laid out his case. Hey, guys, here's why you should have known that I am the Messiah. And hopefully it's going to make the case to us that this is how we can know that Jesus is the Messiah. Now... Again, we don't know specifically where he went, but I'm going to take you to some of those passages that he probably went to. So he probably started all the way back in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. And starting in verse 14, remember this is right at the fall. And it says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And all the snake haters say, yeah. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And some translations say her seed, her offspring or seed. That's talking about Jesus. And right here it says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Again, in the end, Jesus will rise. He will be victorious. Yeah, you're going to strike his heel. Yes, he is going to be in the grave, but three days later, he is going to rise again. So that's the very first reference to Jesus. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, he probably would have gone there. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Now remember, God told Abraham, hey, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and, and I'm going to give you a son. And he finally did. Abraham was like 100 years old, and God finally gave him a son. And he said, I'm going to build a nation from this son. And when that son got to be about a teenager, God said, oh, okay, by the way, little thing here. I want you to take him, and I want you to go sacrifice him to me. And Abraham's like, what? And God just said, just take him to this place I want to tell you. It's about 50 miles away, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham was obedient. And he took him to this place, and he was about ready to sacrifice him. And most of us know the story, but it says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, does anyone know where Mount Moriah is or the significance of it? 
Does anybody know anything special that happened on Mount Moriah? That's where Jesus was crucified. He was having Abraham take Isaac to the very same place where Jesus was crucified. Now, here's another. If you're ever playing Trivial Pursuit Bible Edition, okay, and you get this question, you'll know. Where is the first time in Scripture that love is mentioned? Right there. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. First mention of love in Scripture. You know what's interesting? Is the first mention of love has to do with a father sacrificing his son. Sound familiar? God sending his son, Jesus, to be sacrificed as the penalty for us, as a perfect, perfect sacrifice. He probably would have gone to Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. It says, the scepter or the, the rule, the reign, will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Now, this is one of those ones that you can look at and go, okay, so he's going to be from the tribe of Judah. Remember the 12 tribes of Israel? And it says, it calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. You can't kind of pull off what tribe you're going to be born out of. That's not something you can set up if you're trying to make this as a big hoax. But he was born of the tribe of Judah. He probably would have gone to Exodus chapter 12 and talked about the Passover lamb. And remember, it was Passover week. And Jesus was the perfect sacrifice without blemish, without spot. That's why all those sacrifices that they had to do in the Old Testament, the lamb had to be perfect without blemish and without spot. That's because Jesus was without blemish and without spot. He probably would have gone to Numbers 21. Remember that time where the Israelites were just, just being so bad and so turning from God that God sent these venomous snakes towards them and they were biting them and killing them? And they cried out to God and God told Moses, okay, take a, take a bronze snake, put it up on a staff and hold it up in the air and whoever looks at that snake will be saved. Because Jesus referenced that in John chapter three, verse 14 and says, and as Moses lifted up the servants in the wilderness... Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. It's like that picture of Jesus hanging on the cross that we are to look to him and only him for salvation. He probably would have referenced that. He, he most likely would have gone to Psalm chapter 22, starting in verse 14. Listen to this. It says, I am poured out like water. Now, here's David writing this a thousand years before Jesus probably doesn't even know what he's writing. He's divinely inspired by God to write this, but he probably doesn't even have a clue on what he's writing about. It says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of, dead, of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. Remember, they whipped Jesus so badly that he was unrecognizable, that the flesh was ripped from his body and his bones were literally exposed. All my bones were on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Does that sound familiar? That's the crucifixion. You know what's really interesting? Again, a thousand years before Jesus and hundreds and hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented. The Romans invented crucifixion and it was hundreds of years before that, but it was prophesied and it came to pass. He most likely would have gone to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah prophesied that he would be born of a virgin. He most likely would have gone to Isaiah chapter 9, starting in 6. For, us to us, for unto us is a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. He would have gone to Isaiah chapter 53. He definitely would have gone to Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, or some translations say by his stripes from the whipping and beating, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And we know that was the same as well. In his trial before Pilate, he didn't open his mouth. Three more, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Again, you can't predict where you're going to be born. That's not really a thing that you could do. And Bethlehem, I say this all the time, it'd be like saying, you, Leighton, or you, Winley Key. Like, just, you know, probably half of us don't even know where Winley Key is, okay? No offense to anybody that lives on Winley Key, okay? But it's just saying it's this very, very, very small, kind of insignificant little town. That's where Jesus will come from. Zechariah 9 9, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we know that Jesus rode into town there on that Palm Sunday, rode in on a donkey, the sign of humility. Last one, Zechariah eleven twelve. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me, what? 30 pieces of silver. What do we know about 30 pieces of silver? Who got that? Judas. Yeah, describing here that he is gonna be betrayed by one of his closest followers, one of his 12, for 30 pieces of silver. Now, that was just scratching the surface, okay? There are well over 300 prophecies in scripture. Some think like 351, some think like 360s, okay? But the point is well over 300 prophecies just in the Old Testament about Jesus. Now, what are the odds? What are the odds that 300 plus things would just randomly happen and then there would be this guy and just these things just kind of miraculously happened and he was who he said he was. What are the odds for that to randomly happen? Well, you can't, like I said earlier, you can't decide a lot of those things. But let's have some fun with math. Anybody like math? There's a couple math teachers in here. Okay, so let's, saying let's have some fun with math is kind of like saying let's have some fun by squirting lemon juice in our eye. Okay? I get it. I get it. So, and, and a lot of you guys have heard this illustration before. I thought I'd break it out today. But according to this mathematics and astronomy professor, his name is Peter Stoner. He wrote a book called Science Speaks in 1952. The odds of just eight, now we covered, what, at least a dozen? The odds of just eight of these prophecies randomly happening, are you ready for this? Just by chance, is one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, now who knows what that means? One in 10 to the 17th power. That means one in 10 with 17 zeros following it. That's not great odds, is it? That's eight of these prophecies just happening by chance. Man, 
Dumb and Dumber, he, he had a lot better odds with his one in a million, right? So I want to give you a little illustration to break this down. One in 10 to the 17th power. If you took a silver dollar and you marked one silver dollar, anybody from the great state of Texas in here? Woohoo, Texas. Yay, everybody, Texas. Okay, anyway, whatever. Um, I've, I've never really been to Texas. I've like flown in and out of Dallas, and from what I guess that doesn't really count. Okay, but it's a great state. But there's one thing that most of us know about Texas, and that's what? It's really big, right? Okay, so if you took Texas, and you take one silver dollar, and you mark it, and then you fill the rest of the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet high. It's going to take a lot of silver dollars to get two feet high. The whole state, but you mark one and you hide it in there, and you blindfold someone and you say, okay, go, good luck, right? And they get one shot, and they can go wherever they want in the great state of Texas to find that one marked silver dollar. That is the same odds as eight prophecies happening. Eight random things just happening by chance. Want to take it one step further? <laughs> Let's pray. No, I'm just kidding. You want to take it one step further? Yeah. You guys are like, this is like lemon juice in the eye. Stop. Okay. One more, okay? I promise. So that was eight. Let's take eight more. 16 prophecies. Remember, well over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Just 16 is 1 in 10 to the 45th power. That's a 10 with 45 zeros after it. I'm not even going to use the illustration that he used for this chance to happen because it's like the distance to the sun times 39 or something like that. And that's how big a sphere of silver dollars would have to be with one marked in there. Your odds are not good. And that is for 16 prophecies of over 300 prophecies. Now, here's the point. We could have all this fun with math. I could... I could wow you with some more big numbers, and you guys are like, please don't, okay? I could point out more prophecies. I don't think we need to do that. Um, I could try to convince you that this is all true, but I have something even better and even more convincing that just the odds that all this stuff would happen. Here it is. That there's a God in heaven that loves you. That there's a God in heaven that loved you enough to send his son to die for you. And to, th his son to just have the most miserable, painful death possible for God to show his love to you. That there's a God in heaven that knew you before you were even born. Psalm 139 says, he knitted you in your mother's womb that he knows the hairs on your head, that there's a God that made it possible for you to be here today and even hear this, that there's a God that allowed his son to lay in a tomb for three days. But even better than that, that there's a God that allowed his son to be resurrected three days later to prove that he had authority over death, over sin, over the grave, and over hell. And by his incredible, incredible, amazing grace, by God's grace, he made a way for you to spend eternity with him. See, every person has sin. Pastor Tony talked about it hanging on a cross. You've never made a true commitment to Jesus. Maybe you've never started a real relationship with Jesus. I love, again, how Pastor Tony talked about it, about religion. There's so many religious people out there, and I don't think God cares about religion. That's what he's looking for, not churches. Again, we have all sinned. People tell me all the time, oh, yeah, I'm a good person. 
And I just kind of say, really? Because you think that your good works, that your little bit of good stuff can equal God's grace, that it can add anything to the grace that God has given us. We're sinners. We, we turn from God all of the time, and we choose to just turn our backs from him, and still he continues to pursue us and love us. So he offers us a free gift of salvation. He offers us, hey, do you want to start a relationship with me? That's what he's asking. So I want to offer that to you this morning. Do you want to start a relationship with him today? Do you just want to say, today is the day, God, that I'm going to follow you, that I'm going to give my life to you. God, that I'm going to make a change. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from my former ways, and I'm going to live and give my life to you. Would you bow with me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would anybody say that this morning? Today is the day that I want to start a relationship with Jesus. Would you just slide your hand up? I'm not going to call out on you, but just let me know. You say that this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jesus, I want to start a relationship with you today. Thank you. I see your hand. Anybody else? Today's the day. God, you can have my life. God, I'm trusting in your son and your son only to make a way to, for me to spend eternity with you. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the reason and the significance of today. Resurrection day, that we don't serve a good teacher, we don't serve a prophet, that we serve a risen savior. Thank you, Jesus, that you are that Thank you that you are worth following. We know, God, that you are knocking on hearts this morning. God, would you do what only your spirit can do? Speak to people. God, thank you for those this morning who have decided to put their full faith and trust in you today. God, would you move their hearts in a way that they would see you? Again, thank you, God, that we serve a risen Savior and that we have a reason to celebrate. God, we pray that you would bless this time of offering. God, that you would use it in an awesome way. God, that you would help us to minister in this community, that you would help us to minister in this world. God, that you would help us to be the church that you have called us to be. Not to be a holy huddle of island community church, but God, to reach out into this world and further your kingdom and God, to do things that are gonna matter in a thousand years. God, help us all to have that heart. We pray all of this in your awesome and amazing name. Amen.